we're just about ready to get started now. And um, our director, Linda Vita, is not here today. Um, but uh, on behalf of Linda, um, we'd like to thank the uh, sponsors for the spring 2009 health and equilibrium and water schedule. Um, first of all, we'd like to thank the Department of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Engineering. Um, the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, uh, the Earth Science Division, and the Groundwater Resources Association of California, as well as us, the Water Resources Center Archives. And I would also like to remind you we have some uh, postcards, brochures, pamphlets Look a little hairy. outside, uh, along with a sign up list for our mailing list if you'd like to be informed of upcoming programs um, in California Colloquium on Water and other water related uh, seminars and programming put on by the WRCA. The sign up is outside the hall. And um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Tim Ramirez, who's the WRCA uh, Advisory Board Chair, and he's going to be introducing our speaker for tonight. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Good evening, thanks for coming. Um, I get the honor of introducing our speaker tonight, Mitch Avalon. Um, I just, for the first time, I believe, met Mitch uh, in person, although I've heard many things about his work for many years. Um, and I live in the area, which is even more embarrassing that somebody who works in our local watersheds um, and who I would have thought of cross paths at uh, some level working for the state or local governments that we just met for the first time tonight. Um, Mitch is a graduate of Berkeley, so he's an alum, um, and he also, um, I think will be a good change for what we've seen in the last couple of presentations. If you've been here for the last two colloquiums, usually we talk about California water policy, and it's about there not being enough water, and it's usually about a grand uh, scale or landscape level work, um, and it's really hard sometimes to bring that onto the ground. Uh, Mitch is the other end of the spectrum. It's all about having too much water um, and flooding, and also working, in this case, locally on the creek systems that probably some of you have in your backyards. He's currently the Deputy Public Works Director and Deputy Chief Engineer for the Flood Control and Water Conservation District for Contra Costa County. I have a theory if you have two titles, it means you're really good at your job or you've been around for a very long time. I think it's probably, they're both true in his case. Um, but to give you a flavor uh, for Mitch's uh, extracurricular activities as well, um, he's on the Board of Directors of Friends of the San Francisco Estuary. He's also Chair of the Bay Area Flood Protection Agencies Association. Um, and chair of the Flood Control and Water Resources Policy Committee for the County Engineers Association of California, which is a long way of saying, besides working locally, he's got perspectives um, from other places in the, in the state and probably that matter of the country, which I'm sure are valuable. Um, having said that he's not the same as the big picture, not enough water policy level, I'm sure that local issues on flooding bring a lot of challenges, and those are things he'll talk about tonight. So without further ado, please welcome Mitch. <clears throat> Thank you, Tim. Can everybody hear me? All righty, let me get situated here. OK, I'd like to start tonight by asking you all a question. How many people here know what watershed they live in? Raise your hands if you know. OK, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I always ask this question at the beginning. It's interesting how many people know and don't know. I'm a little surprised my daughter over there didn't know, so I'm going to have to talk to her about that later on. Okay, so tonight is not a technical discussion about some research project with a lot of graphs and, and uh, fancy charts and that sort of thing. It's more of a, a policy level discussion. And let's, let's imagine, if you will, a, a community that's nearby and it has a main street and the main street's where all the businesses are, so everybody hangs out, it's where everything's happening. That's where all the economic activity is. It's the heart, it's the whole, the soul, and it is the identity of this community. It's Main Street. Okay, now imagine, if you will, a future, possible future scenario where, well, let me, let me uh, say one more thing. In this, today's uh, scenario, behind the stores and buildings on Main Street, there's a concrete channel. Everybody kind of knows it's there but nobody really pays much attention to it. And it's got some name, but nobody really remembers what the name is. Okay, so now, let's fast forward to a potential vision for this, this town. The concrete channel has been removed, and there is a natural creek there. The natural creek is much wider, has a lot of riparian habitat, vegetation, there's trails that meander through this wide 
corridor because the corridor has to be wide to provide for the creek and for flood protection. On each side of the, cheek, uh, the creek, there is a pedestrian mall. And then there's buildings, all the, the businesses front on this pedestrian mall that looks out onto the creek. The business owners find that this, this has worked so great. People feel so good about being there. They come from all over just to sit there and look at this creek. The creek has become Main Street. So that's what we're talking about here tonight. All right, so before we get started on, on that, though, I'd like to give a little bit of a background on who we are, what we do. I'm going to give you a little bit of a historical context just to let you know how we got in the situation we got in, talk a little bit about today's context, and then we'll get into this 50-year plan. Okay, so who is Flood Control District? What do we do? Obviously, we do flood protection. Our service area covers the entire county, and I'm talking about Contra Costa County. That includes all the cities. We have about 33 people on staff that deals with planning, operation, and maintenance of our facilities. We have about 72 miles of concrete channels. Uh, I should say channels. Some are concrete, some are trapezoidal. And we have about 30 detention basins. So we provide, uh, obviously, we, we look at things from a watershed perspective. But the interesting thing is, we plan from a watershed perspective, but implementation of our planning really has to be done from a jurisdictional political perspective. So that's very important. Keep that in mind. There are channels, but we don't really control their destiny, so to speak. OK, the historical context. After World War II, there was a huge building boom in Contra Costa County. And this is probably true for a lot of areas in California. And there was a lot of building. Where the communities existed at that time, the historical communities, smaller communities, were in the floodplains. There were a, lot, a lot of them were along creeks. It's very easy to build in the floodplains. It's all flat. That's where all the orchards were. So they cut down all the orchards, built homes, not realizing, maybe, that they were in a floodplain. And of course, flooding occurred. You can't have that. The Foreign Flood Control District told us to go out and, and solve that problem. And we did. So. Uh, we just, so then what we did was we come up with these concrete channels. And why did we do concrete channels? Because it, they asked us to do the most economical option to, pre, to prevent flooding that gives them the more land to use for what's called highest and best use. And at that time, they wanted to have more commercial stores, that sort of thing, and less for the, the creek. We weren't thinking about creeks then. Back then, we were the masters of nature. We, we contained nature. We manipulated nature. That's what we did back then. They also wanted to have the least community disruption. And of course, if you ask an engineer for the most economical solution, you're going to get this thing. And by the way, you can always tell here who the engineer is. And there's two reasons for that. That's right, white socks. That's number one. <laughs> number two is he's got the pen and the paper. <clears throat> so now let's fast forward to today. What are we faced with today? Well, we built all this infrastructure many years ago. And this infrastructure is getting old. Infrastructure, any kind of infrastructure, has a service life. For flood control channels, concrete channels, all those drop structures, all the things that go along with the system, may last 50 to 75 years, something like that. Well, you know, we're going to get to some point where it's going to wear out. What do we do then? So we have this aging infrastructure. We also have what I would consider to be un an unfunded enterprise. We are responsible for maintaining this infrastructure to provide flood protection for our communities. And we are the victim of our successes in the past. We solved the flooding problems. We built all this infrastructure, so there's no more flooding. So nobody really thinks about flood protection anymore. The other thing that's going on here is there's a lot of multiple services in what I call the world of stormwater. And I know this is very simplistic, and I know this is a very complicated, complex arena. But if we just look at water in three Three uh, different areas being, uh, let's see here. I have to use this one. Whoops. 
The laser is All right, so anyway, that's real bad news. <laughs> Technical support? Okay. So, I'm, I, I guess I pushed the wrong button. If you, if you imagine those three circles, you have water, wastewater, and stormwater. And in stormwater, I'm including environmental water, flood protection, groundwater, water for habitat, uh, all those things. Water is your drinking water, drinking water supply, and wastewater is your you know, septic waste. If you look at water, drinking water, there's a rate structure to cover the cost necessary to operate, maintain, and plan that infrastructure. If you're looking at wastewater, there's a rate structure that's in place for you to conduct your services as a business. And if you need to increase the rate to fund whatever you need to fund, you can do that. In the world of stormwater, there is no rate structure. So we only get so much to do what we've got to do. We cannot raise rates. There's a thing in California called Proposition 218. If you want to raise a, a tax or an assessment, you have to get approval of the voters. As I said before, nobody's going to vote for flood protection. Why? Because they don't get flooded. Why should they vote for flood protection when they've, we've already provided all the flood protection? They don't need to pay for it. It's already there. And you know, if, if we're talking about something that's going to fall apart in 30 years, well, that's not my problem either. So when we get back online here, the, the concept here of this whole 50-year plan is we need to convince people, ordinary people, everybody, that there's increased value and benefit to the creek system than just flood protection. And if you go back to all those, the multiple services that are provided in the world of stormwater, power is power. How exquisitely simple. Right this one? That one? That one. <clears throat> I love simple solutions to a complex problem. <laughs> but in this uh, situation, there isn't one. So what, what we're trying to, to do here with, with this 50-year plan is to increase awareness. And we, gotta give, we have to articulate what the value is, the increased value and benefit for people. That it's just not flood protection. There's all these other services going on. If you look at nonprofit groups, for example, that are working in the world of stormwater, and I'm calling stormwater this big umbrella of activities with, with rainfall, you might say. You've got nonprofit groups that work on education in the creeks. You've got uh, nonprofits that are, that are working in the creeks doing restoration work themselves. We've got nonprofits that are uh, providing capacity building. They're helping friends of so-and-so creek uh, provide their minutes and help direct their uh, strategic planning and figuring out what they're going to do in their creek to, to make it better. Uh, you've got science-based nonprofit groups. All these things are, all these groups are working in the, this realm of stormwater. Mission Control to Houston. <clears throat> Yay. OK. Boy, well, so I'm not using pointers again. <laughs> was that was a, the battery was complaining about being low. Oh, is that right? In, yeah, so. Oh. Oh, OK. Well, I feel better now. Thank you. That's good. I'll, maybe I'll go back to the pointer. OK. OK, so we've talked about this then. So the other thing that's going on here, as, as opposed to the past, is that there is more in awareness by the general public about the environment and the impacts of what we do on the environment. There's, a, and I, would, I wouldn't characterize this, go too far on this one, but there's a greater sense that everything's interconnected. And for example, when I ask groups, 
how, you know, how many people know what watershed they live in? I mean, I've had groups that none, zero, know what watershed they live in. So I know those guys need a lot of help. They don't, they're maybe not clear on, on this concept of interconnectedness. And when you do something here, it impacts everything else. And then there is a concept of community design, which is what, what is it that we want to have as our community in the future? What is our vision for the future? And more and more people are getting involved in their community and community planning. And regulations, Keith, are they driving us or what? Okay, so, all right, so why, and I touched on this a little bit when I was rambling with the power out, uh, why don't we just go out and restore all these channels? Well, if you look at the, the funding stream here, this is uh, roughly what people spend on uh, those three areas of water. Drinking water, wastewater, and, and stormwater. So drinking water, you know, you sp people spend about, a residential parcel spends about $700 uh, a year. And this is from our water district, local water district. Wastewater, a little over 300 a year. When it comes to the world of stormwater, everybody in the county pays about, it varies by city, again, simplifying things, but it's about $30 per household per year for clean water activities. And on the flood control side, depending on what watershed you're in, you're either paying zero or a maximum of $70. Walnut Creek watershed, for example, $35 a year. Marsh Creek watershed is about 70. Pinole Creek watershed, zero. <clears throat> so, okay, just a quick reminder on a couple, a couple of things here. I know I told you you wouldn't have any fancy graphs, sorry. Uh, but this is a, a hydrograph. You got time on the x-axis, and you got uh, flow on the y-axis. Oh, and the, over a given storm period of rainfall, this is the response of the watershed as exhibited in the creek of a, of a rainfall, of that rainfall. So if, if you're down somewhere, pick a point in the creek, you're, you're be taking uh, the flows where you have a stream gauge or something. <clears throat> this is what you'll get. The red line is an undeveloped watershed. <clears throat> the hydrograph is flatter. It takes longer for the water to get there. Why? Because the water has to wiggle around grass and some of it soaks in the ground. Some of it grabs onto the grass. It's, it, it's, uh, it's uh, evaporated. Vegetation plays, it plays a huge role in the way water works its way through the watershed and the time it takes to get through the watershed. The blue dashed line is a developed watershed. And in a developed watershed, two things happen. One is you, the, the peak flow, that's the, this is the peak here and it peaks up there. <clears throat> the peak is higher. There's a greater peak flow because you have impervious services, rainwater can't soak in the ground, it shoots right off down in the creek. And because it shoots off down the creek, the second thing that happens, it gets there a lot faster. So the time's compressed to the peak flow here to here. This is a way to destabilize your creek system right there. Okay, the second reminder <clears throat> is floodplains. Floodplains are what is nature's answer to uh, what you do with all this excess water, as Tim was saying. Yeah, was one, one time where we can actually talk about having too much water. That's kind of fun, I guess, in some respects, unless you're living here. <clears throat> <laughs> a natural, in an undeveloped watershed, a, a natural stream, will the low flow channel will contain, you know, there's, there's differences of opinion, but one year flow, two year flow, in this low flow channel. Then all other flows that are higher than that, if you have a frequency storm that's five year frequency or 10 year, it'll flow over its banks out onto the floodplain. So that's what, the, and the floodplains were developed, they were all eroded out and it's, an, it's a landscape form <coughs> near the creeks. After development though, or during development, several things happen. There's modification of the floodplain, first of all, people filling in the floodplains so they don't want to get flooded. That decreases the capacity of the floodplain. And then you've got all these houses in the floodplain, which in a, in a flood, they actually create a backwater flow. I mean, you've got some obstructions there and they slow the water down, although we're talking about slow flows, but it ends up pushing it out a little bit further. We are, so, and remember the pre previous slide, if it's developed, you're generating more flows. So you have to deal with more flows. So keep this in mind when you're thinking about, okay, well, we, let's say we have a concrete channel in my town and I want to, work to convert it. We gotta get all this water that would normally go out in the floodplain like this and put it somewhere. 
because we can't just take a concrete channel out and not worry about the flood protection. That's, it's got to be part and parcel. It's got to be everything. It's got to have the habitat. It's got to have everything. But we can't forget about this. And it takes a lot of room to put this much water in and around the creek. <clears throat> the, other thing, oops, the other thing about this is we're, in, in our world, we have standards. And the kind of the standard is 100-year flood protection. So we're trying to provide 100-year flood protection. And if you've got an old, con uh, old uh, natural creek channel provides two-year protection, you've got to put a lot more water in it when you're putting together a flood control project to provide that flood protection. <clears throat> OK, so all right, so here we go, the 50-year plan. So what exactly is it? It's, it's really, as I mentioned earlier, it's, a, it's, it's an idea. It may not be the solution, but it's more like a process. The solution would be uh, specific to each community. So if a community decides, for example, they want to take a concrete channel out, one community might want to buy out a row of houses and widen the, 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 the channel and put a creek in. Another community might decide they want to build detention basins upstream. Another community might decide they want to put a bypass pipe in and put a little smaller creek. There's just a, a whole host of, of things you can do. But you don't, you're not going to get there. You're not going to get started unless you, you start asking these questions. And that's the whole idea is 50-year plan. The only reason why it's called 50-year plan is because, in my mind, it's going to take a long time. Why? Because we're talking about redesigning communities. You know, you're not going to take one of these concrete channels out and just pop a natural creek in. You're going to have to do some changes in your community. So anytime you talk about this kind of change, you're talking about long-range plans long-range planning. The other thing we're trying to do here is build a community consensus around this plan. This can be a rallying point, a unifying point for, for a community's vision. And it should be integrated into the general plan so that this vision, as I start off with, you're going to have the creek in the middle of Main Street now. That has to be incorporated in the general plan. So all future land use decisions are made to integrate and incorporate that into the community. And that's, again, why it's going to take uh, 50 years. Well, it could be done last time, but uh, I'm calling it that because it's a long time. It's get in people's minds that we've got to start now because it's going to take a long time. And then there's this thing called uh, community design. Whoops, I, I, uh, I hit, whoop. sorry. Uh, this thing called uh, community design, which uh, we'll get into. Well. Community design is, <clears throat> it's a vision for the community. I mean, it's what I call, when I go into a community and I, I'm the flood control representative and there's this creek in the community, we own the channel, but, and we're talking about some project. And I tell the city council, look, I own the creek, but it's your creek. This is your community. What is it you want to do with this creek? You know, we'll work with you to do whatever you want, but it's your community. So a community design, to me, is what is your vision for the creek in your community? Should the creek be an amenity in the community? Should it be incorporated into the community? The root question that I ask is this. The flood control channel has a finite service life, and it's, it's maybe has another 30, 40 years to, to the end of a service life, and we have to start patching, we have to do something. Okay, so. At that end of that period of time, what do you want to replace that channel with? Do you want to replace that concrete channel with another concrete channel and just keep the status quo? Or do you want to replace it with a natural creek system? If the answer is you want to replace it with a natural creek system, then we should start planning today for that eventuality in the future. Rather than scrambling around at the end trying to, to find funding, to, it would be impossible to replace a concrete channel. So that's the community design concept. So from the flood control district perspective, there's, there's some benefits. This, this is a good business decision, the way I look at it. Why? Because I know I'll never get funding to replace a concrete channel. It's going to be very possible. We, we don't have the money to hardly maintain the thing, let alone replace it. it the only way we're going to this, crack this nut is if we increase community support to fund something they want. And that would be, in my, they're not going to want a concrete. I'm, I'm pretty certain they're not going to want a concrete channel. I'm pretty certain, if I ask them, the community, 
they'll want a creek. Now, when I ask the politicians, now that's part of the challenges, you know, they say, well, let's just solve the project we're working on now. We'll worry about that later. <clears throat> the other thing this does for us as a flood control district is this whole discussion increases awareness on who we are and what we do. And we went through several years ago putting together a business plan, and that was part of the whole business plan because people don't even know who we are, and we're trying to get people to understand the value we provide, what services we provide to the community. And then we are included in the community design. So we're at the table wrapping this whole thing around. <clears throat> the other thing is looking at, uh, again, life cycle costs, I, I covered this already, the funding to replace these infrastructure. And then it really is, in, you know, you can look at this, it's really the right thing to do. I mean, we've got to, the regulations are pushing us to increase water, to improve uh, water quality and, uh, and increase conservation of, of stormwater. And we've got hydrograph modification management plans and all these things are intended to increase retention time of stormwater in the watershed. It's kind of the, the, the root uh, issue there. So, th and this helps to achieve that. This last thing, recruitment and retention, it helps us for our staff because they enjoy doing this kind of work rather than replacing concrete channels. <laughs> and just uh, this, this picture here is a remnant of the old Walnut Creek Channel. The Walnut Creek Channel in this neighborhood is a, is a, uh, a flood control channel. This is an oxbow that was a remnant that was left in place. Uh, so this is what the old creek used to look like. So from a community's perspective, if you look at what are the benefits, you know, I mean, how, do I, how am I supposed to sell this thing? Well, there are benefits to community, and it's very similar to the benefits of the district, but it's a different, different slant on it. They're looking at it possibly as a, as a quality of life issue. I mean, they're going to have a natural creek out there. That, that's better for the community. It makes it look better, feel better, improved uh, property values. It's an amenity, and it provides habitat. This crater here is, uh, I don't know if, if people remember or are aware that there was a beaver colony. They're still there in my town. I live in Martinez. And I was, in fact, I was on the subcommittee for this uh, cute, cuddly little furry guy. And um, people, that you wouldn't believe the support for this. I mean, the people were just, this is what you know, rallied the support. I wish I had one of these guys in every one of my concrete channels. Maybe I could get some, <laughs> <coughs> get some funding, get some funding for these. Uh, flood control stuff. The other thing uh, in terms of community benefit is, as I mentioned, you improve water quality. And there's this concept of nature deficit disorder, which some of you may have heard. And if you, it, the concept is that you need, we all need to, to have some time in nature to reconnect with nature. We're, we're, we are essentially beings of nature. We evolved in nature for hundreds of thousands hundred thousand of years, and then the last hundred years, really. We've been an agrarian society, even America, up until maybe hundred years ago. And now we're kind of like urban dwellers. And our kids are growing up in almost a purely urban environment, have no connection with nature. And you know, there's, there's, there's some studies that show there's some problems with that. So the natural creek, creeks can actually improve community health. And then there's a host of green jobs that you can incorporate into this. Again, this brings the community into it. And there are some nonprofit groups out there that you know, would just love to, to partner to, to do these kind of things. And you could have uh, youth groups out there trimming vegetation or carefully. Um, <laughs> you could do, have them doing uh, you know, cleanups, uh, monitoring, water quality monitoring, uh, monitoring <coughs> other things. I mean, there's a lot of things they can do. <clears throat> OK, so, so how do we do this? We got you know, this creek in my backyard. I a concrete channel and want to, want to do something about it. <clears throat> well, it turns out that land use is a big, big part of this. Because uh, you know, if you've been involved in, in any of this community design stuff in the past, you know, or any of these, uh, some of these uh, social issues that deal around neighborhoods, you know, a lot of it boils down to land use. You know, I don't want this project in my backyard, that whole thing. But land use is the sacred cow of local government. And we're talking cities and counties here. <clears throat> so, and if you're gonna if you're gonna take out a concrete channel, and put it in a creek, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to go outside the 
boundaries, the, the property line, if you will, of the concrete channel. That means you're in the city or the county and you've got to deal with you know, land use issues. So does the, does the community want to have a wider swath of land for a, for a creek? You know, it's, it's a tough, it's a very tough uh, nut to crack. <clears throat> there are some drivers out there on cities and counties, and that is, one of them is the stream and wetland protection policy, which is going to uh, have some, a beneficial use for uh, flood, flood uh, retention and uh, there's another one that uh, escapes me right now, but it will help drive the preservation of creeks and the riparian corridor that goes along with creeks. That will help to maintain ex existing channels and also uh, provide some findings because you know the cities are going to have to provide findings and, and justify how they can make this wide corridor for a creek and this can be used in similar findings. The other thing is the, when you, <clears throat> if you're in this process, it's got to be multi-objective. There's no, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier, we've got to get more people understanding the increased benefits and value of this. So it, and to do that, it has to be multi-objective. What does that mean? Well, it means it's not just flood protection. It's recreation. It's habitat. It's uh, providing uh, places for nature, for people to, to actually just you know, play in an unstructured uh, setting and that sort of thing. And then there's this thing, I won't, I won't get into this now, this integrated regional water management plan. <clears throat> it's a state um, requirement that everything be integrated with, you get, this is the state lingo, with the four functional areas of the uh, water world, which is water, wastewater, flood control, and flood protection, and uh, watersheds, habitat. <clears> then <throat> lastly, the, the real kicker here is oftentimes these concrete channels were built by the Corps, the Army Corps of Engineers, and the local flood control district, after they were built, took them on and agreed to maintain them and signed in blood that they would do all these things in this maintenance manual <clears throat> that the Corps gave them back in 1965 or whenever it was. And you, if you read it today, you say, well, I can't do that. And we're in the middle of, this, of a situation now with the Corps where they tell us we have to come in and, and do some work and we can't get permits for it. And we're working with another side of the Corps to rectify it. And it's, but that's the Corps. So unfortunately, uh, if you're going to take out a concrete channel, you have to get uh, the Corps' concurrence because they built it. Anything that, even though the Flood Control District maintains and operates the facility, we, we have to go through the Corps for any changes to that facility. <clears throat> this is another reason why it's going to take a very long time. Because believe me, working with the Corps is painful at best. So this was a, a it, I'm not going to spend any time on this really, just, I just want to show you how complicated things can get. This, I was trying to, trying to flow chart uh, what it takes to, to work in the, a, a creek project and getting permits and that sort of thing. The only thing that, of interest here is, is you'll note that as I mentioned before, the, the nonprofit groups or community-based organizations are, are a lot of these, they're all over the map here. They're in the community-based capacity, stream, working in streams, education, science-based. They provide a lot of services that most people aren't aware of and don't appreciate. And that's another thing, like I say, we, we have to get people to understand and become uh, willing to support this. Okay, so who's involved and, and what role do we all play in this whole planning effort? Well, obviously, the Flood Control District's involved. And in my mind, our role is a cheerleader. And we have to go out and outreach to people and explain what this all is. We have to articulate what is the benefit to a community if we put a creek in. Why should you pay the Flood Control District or whoever to it's going to be expensive. Let me, I'm not, I mean, that's one thing that's getting clear right now. It's going to be very expensive to take out a concrete channel and put a, a creek in. And if you, it's just like anything else in your family budget, if you want something and it's going to be very expensive, you plan for it, you set aside some money, same thing here. So we have to be the, the cheerleaders and, and promote this thing. <clears throat> By the way, this, the, all these photos here are, uh, this is, uh, this is the January 26, uh, 2006 storm. These are all, uh, most of them are all flood control uh, 
past uh, storm photos. <clears throat> okay, in the cities, what's the, what's the role of the city? Well, a city is, is going to have to provide some leadership and vision because, you know, you may think that, well, shoot, Avalon, you own this thing. Why don't you just go out and do it? Well, we can't really just go out and do it because it's in a community and from a long practice and political prudence, we don't do anything in a community unless they support and approve it. We're not, yes, we can condemn properties. We're not going to. We're not going into some city and condemn a row of houses, tear them all down, and widen the, the creek. We're not, we're not going to do that. <clears throat> it has to come from within. And we wouldn't get money to do it anyway. There's not going to be any support for funding if we're going in there with bulldozers tearing houses down. You know, that's the wrong approach. The only approach that's going to work is from within. The city's going to have to want it. They have to provide the leadership and the vision to get us there. So, and then ultimately it has to get into the general plan so we can achieve it. Now don't worry about this guy, he's a trained wildlife biologist. <clears throat> Who else is involved and what is their role? The regulatory agencies. We need them in this process from the beginning to make sure that that we've got everything that's, that they require, the right mix of habitat, et cetera, as we're going through this planning process. Because we don't want to get to the end and we forgot, or somebody says, whoa, didn't anybody tell you about this? And that's, that's not the right time to do it at the end. Everybody's going to have to be flexible. This is not going to be easy to shoehorn a creek into you know, some neighborhood. So there's going to have to be some flexibility. If you remember the San Luis Obispo photo, they had some little concrete walls. It was nicely decorated with stones. But they had some hard armoring. They had vegetation. I mean, it was very nicely done, but it just wasn't a, a completely natural channel. We're talking, to make no mistake about it, we're talking about engineered creeks. It's, it's probably not going to be a completely natural creek. For one thing, natural creeks are dynamic. If you just let them go, they're going to wander around the neighborhood taking out houses every so often. And that's not going to be acceptable after we develop this plan. <clears throat> so we're going to have to engineer them. We're going to have to, they're going to be engineered creeks so that they will not meander as they want to do. The other, the other, <clears throat> the other thing, that, uh, and, and the other thing I want to say about regulatory agencies is they, they need to be a partner in this as a, as a full partner. Community-based organizations, there's, a strong role for them. Somebody's got to be out there and pushing to to do this. The voice of the community. It, do, it does. It, I'm, I can tell you right now, it's not going to go anywhere if I'm the only one standing up at the city council chambers because I've done this before, <clears throat> and uh, say, "Well, you guys want to talk about you know what we're going to do now on this concrete channel? We have a project we're going in, and and we have to cut down some trees." adjacent to the channel because it's a long story, but we didn't maintain these trees for a long time. And they're actually pushing the channel in. <clears throat> and neighbors aren't happy. It's their backyard. And so we had to make several presentations to the city council. And I said, you know, while we're doing this, we're talking about what trees cut down when. And why don't we talk about taking the channel out, you know, and, and looking at that in the future? Well, let's just get through the tree, trees uh, issue here first. <clears throat> And the, and the property owners, they don't want to talk about it either. You have to get the other people outside of the people that live on the creek that are interested in. Citizens, same thing. People got people to push on this if that's what people want. <clears throat> OK, challenges. Again, we are a water-based organization by definition. We're flood protection. That's the service we provide. <clears throat> but we deal in a world of jurisdictional, political jurisdictional reality the reality is, when we implement something, it has to be done in a jurisdictional basis or, or boundary. So we have to be very attuned to that. <clears throat> and there's the, the issue of form and function. We have to provide the function that that, that concrete channels provide was designed for in a natural setting. Let me just throw some numbers out for you to, to give you an appreciation for what we're talking about here. The Walnut Creek Channel, the historic channel I showed a picture of, I, I, I went out and measured the other day. It's about 100 feet, 110 feet wide, I mean, the, the remnants. So that's how wide the, the creek was. This is serving 
uh, one of the largest watersheds in our county, drains about a third of the county. So the, the creek was about 100, say 100 feet wide, 110. The, the flood control channel that, was, that replaced this creek, we called it, we improved the creek <clears throat> back in the old days. When we improved the creek back in the old days, the, part of it was a, a concrete channel where it was very narrow and there was a lot of, there were some railroads and other things. That concrete channel is 50 feet wide. Just downstream of that, very close to the photo where, the, uh, where this remnant was, there was a trapezoidal channel. So the concrete channel flares out in the trapezoidal channel. That is about 300 feet wide. So if you take out that right today, if, when we built it, if we didn't put the concrete channel in, which is 50 feet wide, we would have to put in about 300 feet of trapezoid channel. Take into account the trapezoidal channel doesn't have all the trees and everything else you want. It's a uh, line of riprap, and there's not a tree in sight because that's the way, that's our, that's the way of design. So if you want to add all that stuff, you've got to make it wider. So this is a, this is a challenge. You're going to be you're going to be wipe, you're going to be redesigned communities. That's that's kind of the whole point here. And then there's going to be conflicting interests. Those people who live on the creek may not want to, they may not want this project. You know, they've been living their whole life. But <clears throat> if you look at this from a long-term perspective, 50-year perspective, I was talking to a gentleman earlier from San Lorenzo Creek, and he's saying, well, yeah, we talked about you know buying houses and that sort of thing, but I mean we don't want to have you know, or the we want to have uh, vacant uh, properties and that sort of thing. Well, the way I look at it is, is if a city, say a redevelopment agency is formed, they can buy the properties as they come up for sale. They don't have to condemn the properties. Over a 50-year period, virtually every house turns over in California, almost guaranteed. By the end of the 50-year period, when you're ready to replace the channel, if you bought them as they come up for sale and you just rent them out in the meantime, you got, you know, property management division just rents them out. So it looks just like the rest of the community. And then, son of a gun, you've, you've got a whole row of houses there, which, which you figure that you need the whole row of houses to tear out and widen the channel. <clears throat> you know, as, and, and redevelopment can do that. But there's going to be conflict. I mean, you just can't get around it. The other thing is that this whole concept of political leadership in California, politics revolves on a four-year cycle. And try and convince somebody to think about 50 years when they're only thinking about three and a half years from now. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's very difficult. And then getting a whole community to come to agreement on what their vision is and have a unified vision, that can be difficult. On the other hand, it can be unifying for a community to talk about this. So it may be difficult to come to a unified vision, but it may be unifying for the community to do that exercise. Funding is going to be uh, very, very difficult. People are going to have to be willing to pay for it. How, you know, how much do you pay for your cell phone every month compared to how much you pay for clean water every year? $30 every year for, cl for clean water. And how much do you pay for bottled water? <clears throat> Most people here I know don't use bottled water. <clears throat> and of course, I can't talk, and nobody can talk today about challenges without having climate change tossed in there. So uh, I just threw it in there. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it. <clears throat> OK, so what, are, so what are we doing? And we, I'm just not up here flapping my lips. We're actually trying to, to achieve some of these uh, concepts. and. In fact, uh, Alhambra Creek is, a, is a, a, I would say, a success story, uh, although the flood control district wasn't necessarily involved. But in Pinole Creek, this is a, the creek where we have zero funding. And because we had zero funding there, this is the way California uh, works for special districts. After Proposition 13, 1978, the tax rate was locked in at zero. <clears throat> so we have zero funding. So we've been spending a lot of time trying to, to talk to the city and working with the city to, to develop some funding mechanism. So we originally came at this from a funding angle, because we need money. That's the, the bottom line. I mean, from a purely self-interest perspective. So we, we got a grant, 
and we work with the friends of Pinole Creek and the Resource Conservation District and a bunch of other folks in the city, and they developed a vision, what they call a vision plan. And this <coughs> articulated what, and this is around the creek, of course. So this articulated what they wanted to do with the, with the creek. Then they developed this Greenway Master Plan, and that is a more detailed, the next level, layer up, level up, excuse me, of planning. And they could actually then do some projects off of it. So we're actually uh, building a project here. We got a $2.6 million River Parkways grant. And this project, although this is the concept, it's not nothing ever goes according to the original concept. But it's a marsh plain restoration. We're taking the access road off on one side of the creek channel to widen it and adding a bunch of vegetation and trees. Um, but, uh, and as this is designed, the city was going to award the contract. They can't because the funding was frozen at state. So this is on hold right now. But in any event, the reason, the part of this, this strategy for us and this whole 50 year plan thing is that, and the reason why we're calling it a demonstration project is this will be what we now use to go into community and promote and say, look, you've got this vision, you've got this Greenway master plan, which the master plan goes all the way up the entire flood control district owned facility, which is up to I-80. I this is your plan, your vision. This is what it looks like. Go down and look at it. If you want to carry this forward, then we need to, to vote some kind of a funding, municipal funding measure. You need to vote so we can get the rest of the creek to look like this. So this is a demonstration to show the public what the rest of the creek <coughs> could look like. <clears throat> OK, now it's your turn. I'm giving you guys a little homework assignment. Besides those guys who don't know which watershed they're in, I have two assignments. <clears throat> I had mentioned earlier that there, in the world of stormwater, there's the people who are involved in it are all across the board. There is no unifying institutional structure. And maybe one reason why we haven't been successful in obtaining funding and why nobody pays attention to us is because we don't have unifying structure. We've got all these nonprofit groups out there doing all these good things and little sectors of society may be aware of them, and, but most people aren't. But there's, but there's nobody out there that's, that's kind of bringing this whole thing in. We have no rate structure, so we're, we're kind of you know, funded as a you know, catch as catch can kind of thing. So the assignment <coughs> is who should manage the stormwater systems? And when I say stormwater, I don't, I'm, I'm talking about everything environmental, water, habitat, watersheds, water quality, flood protection, everything. We've been working for years to have flood control and stormwater on the same status as water supply and wastewater in Proposition 218, about 10 years on, for legislation. And we have not been successful. And what, th what that would mean is we would be able to treat it like a utility and we'd, have a, we'd be able to establish a, a rate structure. Well, what, ha what would happen if Schwarzenegger called me up tomorrow and said, look, Avalon, we'll give you the money. You know, just tell me what you can do with it. Well, I mean, I could spend it all probably on flood protection, but, but that's not the point. I mean, we need to, to look at this stormwater thing holistically. If we're going to succeed, we've got to bring all these, these activities in. So how, who, how are we going to manage this? I mean, if we did get the money, how are we going to manage it? And what institutional structure should we have? Should we just keep all the special interest districts and everything, have an umbrella group, council, or something over it? Or should we restructure the whole thing? And this is kind of what's going on in the Delta. How the heck do we manage and govern the, the water management system in the Delta? Ye gads. <clears throat> but really, this is, is kind of the same, same question. So that's your, should you choose to accept this assignment? <laughs> I think, you know, unless you're, unless you're in math class, maybe you can make you do it. But. <clears throat> So that's it. This is an idea. It's, you know, as you know, ideas can be very powerful. Uh, we'll see where it goes. This is a process. It's going to be, a, in my mind, it's a community design issue. It's going to take a long time. But we have to start the conversation or it won't happen. 
Thank you very much. I can probably do this without a microphone. Mitch, I've heard you talk before, and you talked a little more about sea level rise as a driver. I mean, you've talked about the age of the infrastructure and the problem that they're not going to last forever. But tell the, tell the good folks what 8 inches, 12 inches more uh, bay water is going to do to all the flood control facilities. <coughs> now, that's a good question. Uh, so if you look at Panola Creek, when, when flood control districts design a, a facility and provide a certain level of flood protection, so FEMA's uh, level is 100 year flood protection, they give us a water surface, a starting water surface elevation. And it's based upon uh, historical data, tide elevations, and, and that sort of thing. And in fact, FEMA right now is doing a bay tidal study update, and they're going through all the, the old historical tidal uh, data and and uh, this isn't this has and this doesn't have anything to do with uh, global warming. This has to do with storm surges and all the things that came out of Katrina, because Katrina, uh, New Orleans was designed for a, I think it was 200 or 250 year low protection, but it couldn't stand the 35 foot, 40 foot storm surges. And they had designed the system as a as a static system. Well, nature is not static; it's dynamic. So Congress said, "What are you guys doing? You're designing these things for a." Without storm surge, what it does doesn't make sense. So the Corps and FEMA had to go out and, and figure out what we should be designing for, given the local weather conditions. So in the Bay Area, we don't have storm surge like they do in New Orleans, obviously. But we do have wind fetch across the bay. We do have uh, run up, wave run up, due to meteorological conditions and other things. So <clears throat> when they do all that, we could have starting water services this is aside from, from sea level rise, water, starting water surface that might be one or two or so feet higher than they are now. And then on top of that, we have sea level rise, which is one of the components of global warming. And I'm, I'm sure you've all heard about you know, less snowpack in the Sierras, flashier storms, so you'll have more flooding, and you know, more storm surges come through the delta into, into the bay, and all those things. Well. So now, this, this channel here was care carefully <laughs> crafted, this project, um, to, to meet the design criteria for the Army Corps in 1965. Why? Because of the challenges I mentioned earlier. We can't fit anything in here. All the Corps requires us to do is to meet the original design flow. So that's in 1965. We can fit that in here, but that Right now, the flows today are 40%, 42% more than they were in 1965. So right off the bat, they've lost uh, the, the level of protection they had originally. Now when FEMA comes in, and they will someday and remap this area, half of downtown is going to be in a floodplain. They're not in a floodplain now because after the flood control project was built, FEMA looked at it and said, well, you know what? It was all contained in channels, so nobody pays flood insurance. Well, that will change when they look at the current hydrology. All of the FEMA maps that you're looking at today are based on 30-year-old hydrology. Almost all of them. <clears throat> the ones that I'm aware of, anyway, <clears throat> in our county. I'm qualifying that quite a bit now. So <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Probably. Is that the same in Alameda County? That uh -oh. old hydrology? Yeah, we've been doing studies with them. Though. Yeah. So there's been some updates here and there. So and then you add sea level rise on top of that, which may be a meter, so like three feet, and suddenly you're going to have to have either, well, flood walls might be one option. Uh, I mean, there's, you're going to have, there's, there's going to be a, a big problem. You're going to reduce flood protection as you, as you move along here in time, and you're going to have to deal with that with either flood walls, levees, or, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a big challenge. I don't know, does that answer your question? <laughs> All righty. Do you have either a, a website or a map or some, some resource that we can use to go out and take a look at some of the good examples, some of the bad examples, sort of educate ourselves on uh, what's been done? 
A, like a concrete channel? Uh, well, concrete channels I could probably find. Yeah. But uh, I was thinking that some of the more interesting places, like uh, you, you mentioned specifically <coughs> the one in Walnut Creek where the Oxbow was, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there are other, uh, I assume there's some examples you think that have been done well that would be interesting to look at, and yeah, some I don't, are exceptionally bad that would be <coughs> right. interesting to look at. There have been a lot of restoration projects. Um, Matt, you have, don't you guys keep track of those things? You have a, on your website? Yeah, so, so maybe, Matt, you can you, uh, tell your website. Uh, at the uh, Water Research Center archives, there is a uh, river restoration website that yeah. you, you can get to it from the Water Resource Archives webpage. It's maintained by the archive. Yeah. And yeah. we have a lot of uh, those project appraisals on there as some yeah. summaries of the, uh, the uh, river restoration studies. Yeah, great. Thank you. So, that, yeah, so there, that's a great resource. <clears throat> Um, Mitch, a lot of people today are really interested in rainwater collection, uh -huh. and I think somewhat mistakenly they're looking to their water supply districts for help with that, for mm -hmm. information, for incentives, and really I think the, um, a lot of the benefits of rainwater collection would be conferred on the flood control districts, or if nothing else it would be shared by multiple agencies, mm -hmm. yet these agencies tend to not talk to each other and you know have their silos. Mm -hmm. How can we move to where the agencies are working on joint projects of mutual benefit, such as rainwater collection? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, let me answer that two ways. One, there's this, uh, and I mentioned it briefly, this integrated regional water management plan in the Bay Area. And it requires, this is the state, this is a requirement of, of the state uh, to integrate planning across what they call functional areas, of, of four functional areas of water. Water supply, wastewater, flood protection, and uh, watersheds and habitat. <clears throat> and, and I go to these meetings, like some people here. And so we're, in order to get bond funding, because a lot of the funding through the bonds now that are approved by the voters, the Congress writes into them, the Congress, the, the legislature writes into them that they have to be, they have to go through this integrated, we affectionately call it a Irwump. Sounds like a Dr. Seuss animal, but it's more complicated than that. <clears throat> you have to go through these, uh, this planning and you have to get your projects on the plan. In order to get on the plan, they have to be integrated. So you have to look for opportunities to integrate water supply and wastewater. So maybe a, a creek project uh, for, for flood control is a very uh, easy alliance, I would say, between flood protection and habitat and restoration. That's, that's simple. And Contra Costa is more difficult when you're talking wa uh, water supply because we import almost all our water from the Sierras or the, or the Delta. And then the wastewater, we have, we, we've identified some joint projects with the wastewater. But this is the beginning. So to answer your question, yeah, I think it's coming and it's going to take uh, you know, some time for people to, to really get into this integration. And we're required right now, in fact, I'm just working on a process uh, with Alameda County, in fact, a uh, process on a sub-regional level to <coughs> integrate projects and, and, and then promulgate a list of projects that we feel from a sub-region is our best integrated projects for any particular grant round. There's also, to answer your question, uh, regional projects within this and rain harvesting, in fact, is a very popular uh, regional project. Uh, caution about rain harvesting from a flood protection perspective. If you have a 1,500 square foot roof, for example, and you have one inch rainstorm, if I did the math right, you get about 900 gallons of water. That's 18 50 gallon drums. The, the 2006 storm, which I showed some pictures of, that was about three to four inches of, of storm uh, rain over, over about 12 hour period. <clears throat> So if you're going to, if you're thinking about this as a benefit for flood protection, you have to have a lot of rain barrels. And then you have to tell everybody before the big storm, which we don't know exactly when it is, dump them all out and <laughs> wait, wait, fill them up. <clears throat> so the, you know, the, the coordination and the, the, the storage, the volume, and then the other thing is in our, the where I live, Martinez, only about 20% of the watershed is developed in the town. So if you have all the, everybody in town, and the beavers too, 
they're gathering barrels of, of water, rainwater. We still have 80% of the watershed that's just kicking out flood water. So <clears throat> I agree there is, there is there's definitely benefits there. Um, but in uh, maybe Baxter Creek, which is, uh, which is almost all built out, it, it might be a greater benefit. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what kind <clears throat> of cross section you're looking at for these channels and how armored they are in terms of and how that impacts like erosion control in the future and then what kinds of habitat you're expecting to get you know, what kind of habitat value you're expecting for this this one here yeah or for <clears throat> other ones that you this okay well this this project right here there's no armoring on this uh, the because we had zero money and it's kind of ironic in this watershed we did no maintenance and fortunately, we didn't have flooding and weren't sued, but the, the creek channel, the low flow channel here, uh, established a, an essentially an equilibrium state over a, about a 20 year period. So in this project, in the, we did sediment source studies, um, working with some grad students and that sort of thing, and we've, we found out that there's not a lot, there's some certain areas up in the upper watershed that generates a lot of sediment. But actually, it doesn't deposit here. It, it, so, this, so the sediment transport actually worked out pretty good. So what we're doing here is we're, we're restoring the marsh plain. So we are taking out some sediment, moving the access road back for capacity. And we're putting in some short, little stubby flood walls to accommodate the Corps' requirements. <clears throat> and there's going to be um, trees, uh, repairing trees along the, the creek on one side. The city is going to have a trail on this side here with uh, lighting and benches and all that stuff. And they, the city is going to maintain the landscape, the, uh, we call it landscaping, but the, the repairing uh, plants and landscaping along the trail. <clears throat> That's part of the deal because we have no money in this particular watershed. Um, that was part of the deal is that they would do the, the maintenance. The interesting thing about that is that the city is our partner in trying to convince the public that they need to pay for this because the city needs money too to pay for the maintenance of the trail and the lighting and all this other stuff. So, you know, this is really is synergistic, all this stuff uh, for us. I think for everybody. <clears throat> Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, if, you, if you could imagine for a minute that you were in Spain and that you were given all the money that you needed to do, and this project was in Spain, mm. how would you go ahead and do it? You wouldn't have to cope with the Army Corps of Engineers or California's rules. How would you do it to do the very best job? I'd have to learn Spanish first, I guess. <laughs> <clears throat> do this project here? Yeah, just kind of show well, us what you do differently if you were working for a dictator. <laughs> well, <laughs> Okay, I mean, we, I mean, if, I mean, and you don't have to work with the community? Yeah. No? Well, yeah, I mean, if we, if we and we just go in and, and, and do the project, we could design it. I mean, we could do it like we did in the old days. We didn't talk to anybody. We just, <laughs> we in the back room, go, tell the engineers that we want a channel from here to here. In this case, I go back and say, okay, I want a natural creek from here to here. You know, here's your budget, and the money's no object. Uh, and they would design it. And, uh, you know, we would we'd bring in some consultants to look at uh, sediment transport and some other things, and bring in some some folks to get the biology right and the plant the plant uh, selection right and this that and the other thing, and we just go out and do it <clears throat> in Spanish. It would look it would look just like this. Uh -huh. Now, if the if the objective was if the objective was to to provide 100 year protection, we would be taking out a row of houses. That's the difference in this community here. So yeah, we could, we could, we could do it. We, but we could do it in Spain. We couldn't do it here. <laughs> Are you a little bit concerned that the flood wall protection won't be enough and 
the flooding will occur and then people said oh look at this natural creek and now we're all flooded and it's a bad PR situation for restoration of, of these urban creeks? One of the, that's a great question. On this particular project here, one of my great concerns is that when we build this project, people are going to see, you know, all this equipment out there, cranes and everything else. They're going to make the leap of faith that they'll never get flooded again because we've done all this work on the creek. My God, how could I ever get flooded? And I, I've made, every time I go to the city council and, and we've had community meetings, I hammer on the point that this does not provide 100 year flood protection. This is an improvement, and I have a chart. I, I do have charts on that one. <clears throat> and it is kind of fancy, but it shows the level of protection they had in 1965, and, the, and it shows the, the reduction in flood protection as the creek sedimentation the sediment encroached on the flood capacity. And then it shows the increase in flood protection with the project. And if nothing's done, it'll decrease again. And we do have some other options in that community for, for detention upstream and some other things. Also on that graph, this is why it's so fancy, on the bottom is it shows the increase in flows over time. So the flows are increased, low protection is going down. This will increase the, if, this will increase the low protection in 22 years. It was originally a 50-year design with freeboard, which contained 100-year flows. And we can get up to about 22 years with this project. But it meets the core requirements. <clears throat> That's the best we can do in this community. Another thing that people may need to face is we may not be able to afford 100-year protection. We may have to live with flooding. We may have to raise homes or relocate homes, or maybe it's cheaper to do that I mean, there's a little neighborhood flooding in Contra Costa. It floods two houses. It's cheaper to buy the two houses than to deal with the solution to the flooding problem. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? <laughs> uh an ancillary question. What about uh, other types of stormwater management techniques like bioswells and things like that and, you know, incorporated more into the residential neighborhoods on the <coughs> little tributaries into the, <coughs> into the creeks? As, uh, and like taking out storm drains, putting in swales, yeah, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the... Um, or like parking lots, you know, just slowing mm -hmm. down the water inside, right. you know, um, throughout the community. Yeah. All of that helps because it increases the retention time of stormwater in a watershed so that you'll never get back to the original hydrograph. You remember the hydrograph, you never quite get back there, but you will stretch out the, the, the developed hydrograph. You will stretch that out somewhat. If you can do all of the, you know, the regional board has these, uh, this provision in our uh, stormwater permit that uh, requires uh, this, the, the real root strategy to try and increase stormwater in the watershed. So you have all these uh, on-site uh, infiltration of stormwater. So every home that's built now has to have, you know, they can't have any more water leave the site than was, that was uh, leaving the site before, and the duration can't be anymore. <clears throat> so all those things are going to help. But the only time you get flooding is when the watershed's saturated and you have a, an intense storm. Mm -hmm. So if you have all these infiltration little features uh, and, and on site and the, and the watershed <coughs> is saturated and including these little features around the house, you're still going to get flooding. <clears throat> I mean, you'll, you, won't have, you won't have the, the same runoff because you won't have as many impervious surfaces, but if the watershed is saturated, if there's no impervious surfaces, and um, there's one photo there in 1958, Wall Creek, guys are in waders walking across. Uh, that was undeveloped, basically an undeveloped watershed, and you got that, you know, three feet of water running running through town. So <clears throat> it, it it helps, but it's not going to stop uh, the big, you know, flood stormwaters. It'll help a little bit. <clears throat> 
Bruce King with uh, Friends of San Lorenzo Creek and the mm -hmm. San Lorenzo Creek watershed. Um, it, it seems to me in our watershed that, and I guess this is the same way in all urban settings, is that <coughs> development is really the driver, the, the economic engine that pushes pushes on the creeks and and you know pushes the development up to the edge of the creeks. And even when we have ordinances and we think we've got protection, there's still uh, I mean, it takes, it's a constant battle to try, figure, out, figure out how to keep the development back far, far enough back, how to, how to protect the creek. So my ex observation is even when we restore parts of a creek, we're probably demolishing as much creek as we are restoring it at any given time. I'm kind of wondering how we overcome this, you know, where the, the agencies, you know, like Hank's agency that, you know, tries to do, do good. They don't have enough funding mm -hmm. and they don't have enough and then there's not enough enforcement, enough time to regulate. Um, so how do, we, how do we overcome the cycle of, you know, there's, there's no money to protect the creek, but there's money to develop? Well, I guess part of it's a cultural change in some respects. I mean, as a, as a society, maybe we don't place enough importance on this. Why? Because maybe we don't understand the innate value and, and the, the benefit of, of these creeks. You know, it's, even these little, little swales provide wildlife corridor through neighborhoods, you know, up to the upper watersheds, which may be open space, and the critter, you know, animals can migrate back and forth. You have to be vigilant. I mean, it takes community action groups, friends of this, that, and the other thing, or whatever uh, groups there are out there, um, to get involved in the local community and, you know, to, to raise those issues. An interesting, um, uh, let me just, play off of that question. I've, uh, one of the communities that I have talked to about this 50-year plan is interested in, in doing a modification of a, con of a um, flood control channel through the development process, which is very intriguing. <clears throat> there are opportunities out there. In this case, it's a huge parking lot, and they've got a shopping center, and the shopping center is way up on the other end, away from the creek, and you got this huge parking lot right up against the creek. So some retirement fund in England bought this whole shopping center, and maybe it's the British way, I don't know. But anyway, they want to redo it so that they have the buildings near the creek and restore the, the this is a riprap channel, uh, trapezoidal channel, and restore it into more of a natural creek. You have a flood terrace and, and all the stuff and trails, and have the, the, the living part of their project rather than the parking lot next to the creek. So if, if we can pull this off, then this will be another, you know, something to point to. And Matt can put it in his, you know, Matt, this is, will not be a, I don't know if you're putting these kind of things in here, but this is like a development driven thing that's, you know, a good design. They might, I don't know if you do those or not, but. So, <clears throat> I mean, you can start looking around and this, I think Baxter Creek did this too as with part of the, whether it's Safeway or some store down there, where they, they negotiated uh, in their parking lot to do some, some creek restoration work. So, you know, there are some innovative things that you can do if you, can, if you have the vision to see what the potential is out there. And you get in, you have to get in on the ground floor. Because once they get things, you know, once developers get their plans set, and then it's just, they don't want to change, just get, you know, just charge, charge forward. But development can be your ally. So don't forget that. You have to be vigilant to make sure they don't um, overbuild you know, creeks and that type thing. But there can be an opportunity too. Um, I have a question. In terms of uh, trying to get a city to start to be thinking in the right direction, mm -hmm. um, which do you think is more important, the council, the Department of Public Works, or the planning? Well, I think you know, you, you really should work with staff first. And I mean, if, if for, for me, I, I really don't want to go to council without going to the staff first. Now the community members can go, they're, they're elected officials, they can go to the council. But if you're talking about me, I wouldn't do that. I work with staff. So in a, when I go to the council, I talk about these things. You know, I talk about the staff first, and a lot of times they're, yeah, that sounds great, you know, but as long as the council agrees. 
<clears throat> or there may, be the, there, there may be some staff that, you know, we've got this project, we've got to get this thing done, we don't want to hear about <laughs> any of this other stuff. We don't want to hear about it. So it all, it all depends. If you're a, a public citizen, you can go right to the, to the council because they do what you want. I mean, that's the democracy, a sort of <clears throat> way it works. But if they don't hear from you, they, then they don't think there's a problem. If there's no problem, then why change? Right? <laughs> Could you give us an idea of, of your your jurisdictional domain, uh, like what is the length of, of, of uh, flood channels that are, are under your jurisdiction and w what are the opportunities, what proportion of, these, of this domain is, is, has opportunities for this in the near term, this type of 50-year uh, project, restoration project that you're talking about in the near term? We, the flood control district owns and maintains 72 miles of channels. Some of them are concrete, some are trapezoidal, and a whole bunch of other structures that go along with it as a system. And we also have 30 detention basins as, as, um, around the county. There are about 1,300 miles of creek in the county. So we, we don't own that much if you're looking at the whole the totality of the, uh, the creeks in the county. But what we do own is the, the, major, the major parts of the downstream, usually downstream ends of these creeks. Because that's where the communities are. That's the low line, the, the slope of the, 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 the creek is, is uh, less and you've got more flooding down there. When you're on the, when the gradient of the creek is steeper, your upper, upper watersheds, you don't have any problem, nobody really cares. Uh, the lower, the gradient of the creek is flat down the bottom, everybody floods. So that traditionally, all of our channels are the, the big uh, regional facilities in the lower parts of the watershed. Frankly, we're going to start with the easy stuff first. We're not going to take out a concrete channel tomorrow. We're going to do this. This is a, was a trapezoidal channel in Panola. Upstream of this, there is a concrete uh, channel, vertical wall channel. But we're not going to we're not going to tackle that one. We're going to get everybody to to buy in on this first before we tackle that. the The concrete channel is going to take a long time. I don't I don't think there is any near term when you're talking about replacing concrete channels. In my opinion, we're going to start with the trapezoidal channels because they're easier and you can get people to see what it is you're talking about. <clears throat> so what proportion of that is of, of, your, of, of your jurisdictional domain that is realistically available for that? Is that 5% or less? Well, of our, we, our jurisdiction, our service area is a whole county. But we only have 70, 70 miles of, of channels. So are you asking how many are concrete channels or oh, how many? Would there be opportunities for this type of project in, in that 70 miles? Would that be less than 5% or 10%? Oh. <clears throat> well, there's, I think ultimately there's opportunities for all of it. In the near term, I, I, I understand your question now, I'm sorry. In the near term, I'm working with one's community on this, um, and they're still interested in this. Um, I'm having a meeting with them in a couple of weeks, the city manager and the city engineer. This is a development project I was mentioning that has this big parking lot and shopping center. And <clears throat> they want to redevelop it and focus, just like the Main Street vision in the beginning, they want to focus the buildings on the creek. So that's something that, that we can work with. There's an opportunity there. We're working with another community in East County. <clears throat> There's a concrete, excuse me, um, a Marsh Creek. There is a park. The city got a million dollar grant to, re, to design this park and build it. And we're going to uh, restore the creek within the confines of the length of this park. And again, we have funding arrangements with the city on that. So, and San Pablo, uh, same thing. So, you know, there's, there's opportunities out there and, uh, and they just kind of, I mean, people 
it, it just kind of happens. You know, once you start doing this, it just kind of happens. So uh, there's a c couple of places that I'm actively working in, and then sometimes I just get a call. And so we, and, yeah, we have lunch, we talk. <laughs> I, um, I like your point about trying to uh, incorporate some of these um, <coughs> visions into the general plan of local government, for mm -hmm. example. And, but have you seen an example of a general plan that incorporates language like um, acquire property within X feet of X feet? Um, do you have mm -hmm. some examples? Or is that yeah. something that we need to try to work in? <coughs> Yeah, that's that's something that's I, there. There is there is no general plan I'm aware of that has that uh, currently, and you have to be careful about putting that kind of specific language in a general plan. That's more implementation. A general plan is is a guidance for it's a blueprint for development of a community. It is the vision document, and it it generally <coughs> won't say buy this property, buy that property. That's an implementation uh, level of detail. What it will say is that we want to widen this creek and the estimated width of the corridor, which might meander around, it might, might uh, be 100 feet or something. So, I mean, you can kind of deduce what it is, but you don't say we're buying Mrs. Jones' property, <clears throat> if that makes sense. So, you, you want to have the language in there that will get you to, to where you, you want to go, but by definition, general plans have to be kind of broad level uh, perspective. But no, there, there isn't any that I'm aware of that has that kind of uh, planning detail. Uh, there's, I mean, there's required elements in general plan, and they all have, they all talk about, uh, a lot of them talk, ours, uh, Contra Costa County talks about um, preserving riparian corridors, for example, but it doesn't have anything in there about, um, you know, preserving right away for a future conversion of a flood control facility to a creek. But there's a 50 foot on each side of, the, of a creek for preservation of, uh, of, of a repairing corridor in, in Contra Costa County's general plan. That's a, that's a policy and a goal. Is that it for questions? Okay. Um, uh, well, one question is you, you had mentioned the beavers. Uh -huh. and, uh, I think there might be an interesting lesson to learn there. I mean, on, on the one hand, the beavers might make your job more difficult by you know, building in the you know, flood channel. But on the, on the other hand, it brought the public attention that, that right. seems like we need. Right. So, I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about that? <clears throat> Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> yeah that, I mean, that's exactly correct. So a lot of times in these situations, you have to try and you know, squeeze out what is the win-win here. I mean, what, what is the opportunity? Maybe I'm not too much of an optimist. And you know, sometimes my guys don't like me to go around too far because they'll come back with too much work for them. <clears throat> but in this case, in fact, the city of Martinez asked me to be on the on the Beaver subcommittee, they call it, uh, <laughs> to try and figure out. So, just uh, in three minutes, uh, blurb here on this. The, the Beavers established a colony in Alhambra Creek, right in downtown Martinez, and they had some wildlife biologists out there that that actually deal in beavers from Vermont, and they say, hey, this guy's been all around the world. And he said, I have never in my life seen a colony of beavers in an urban area like this. And they had news cameras down there. People would go down there and, and view the beavers, and the beavers didn't care. And they said, this is really bizarre. This is the, the, the most uh, you know, accepting uh, beavers that he's ever, ever seen. And they had, um, so this, the property owners were complaining along the creek because they had built flood protection improvements and paid for them. And they were concerned that the beaver dam was reducing capacity in the creek and was going to impact their, their property and flood their property. And they threatened to sue the city. <clears throat> so the city was in a bit of, and it was in a really uh, political, uh, uh, difficult situation. 
So they were going to evict, essentially, well, they, were, they got a depredation permit, so that's going to mean, means kill the beavers from fish and game because they're not a protected species in accordance with fish and game code. So they were, they were ready to, to get the permit, and they went to, they had this council meeting, and all the, the people showed up at the council meeting, and there's like 200 people at the council meeting, and the council goes, whoa. <laughs> Let's think about this. So what does a political organization do when they get into a tight spot like that? They form a subcommittee. <laughs> so they formed a beaver subcommittee, and they asked me to be on it and a bunch of other, uh, some other folks. And so um, there were 17, we actually um, looked at and then made a report in this thing about that tech, 17 different areas of the impact the beavers have on the community of Martinez. <coughs> Water quality, habitat, uh, groundwater. Uh, the only one I was involved in was flood control and, and the uh, soil stability of, of the increased water level and the potential of earthquake, of uh, liquefaction and earthquakes, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so anyway, we came up with seven alternatives, options for providing flood protection enhancements to allow the beavers to coexist with the community. They all cost money. So again, you know, what is, what is the value of, of the beavers or in this particular community? So uh, they, it, it's, it's hard to tell. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm still not sure what happened. We gave a report to the council. I don't think the council actually voted on it. They just kind of accepted it. Nothing actually happened. <laughs> Newspaper reporters went away, and <clears throat> but the beavers are still there. One of the property owners uh, continued on the rallying point of, of, of suing, so the city actually went in and, and put a, a sheet pile wall alongside the property, right where the beaver dam was and the lodge. And they've, so they've neutralized that, the objection of that particular property owner, and I think, I, I haven't heard there's really any other opposition. So the beavers are still there. They, during the construction, they went downstream to another dam, and they moved back, so they're still there. But the win-win the here, I think, was, was that there was, a, there was an opportunity here to get funding for flood protection improvements that, whether the beavers are there or not, would help the community. So in my report to the council, I said, you know, we made some recommendations, and all of these recommendations were system-wide improvements, whether the beavers are there or not. So if they do these improvements, they're going to benefit or increase flood protection in the community. And you, you can leave the beavers there too if you want, you know, as a, as a kind of side note. So the, the point was from a community infrastructure perspective, from an investment perspective from the, from the city council, this is a good business decision. You can use the beavers to get grant money to build something <laughs> that you can, you can benefit from. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so, the, so they've, uh, they've actually and, uh, taken some of the recommendations, and when they put in the sheet walls, they've done uh, some of the, incorporated some of those recommendations. They're redoing uh, the street next to it. One of our biggest uh, suggestions was to have overland release through the, through the park, but they have to lower a road, and they're planning on doing that with this reconstruction of the road. So it may all work out. But you're right. I mean, everybody was, uh, community involvement was, uh, was tremendous. And there was an opportunity there. You just have to figure out what the opportunity is. I knew the beavers would come up. <laughs> they always do.